He's going to take up a hearing on the use of drones, on the issue of drones, because this technology has been so effective overseas. Now some people are wondering what the use could be here at home, Chef. Of course, the cynics will say, you know, Jeb Bush has his book, Marco Rubio has his immigration, Rand Paul needed something, so he chose a drone. They, well, they, all, look, they all need some FaceTime. If you were watching social media last night, he blew up Twitter. So yeah, he, he tapped into something, whether it's younger people, whether it's uh, libertarians, I don't know what it was, but there was a lot of buzz. A lot of people who didn't know the junior senator from Kentucky now know who he is. Yeah. I'm not saying they're going to vote him to be president, but he certainly has a lot better name ID than he did, say, 36 hours ago. He's on the landscape, there's no doubt. Mike, thanks. Judge Napolitano has just come to the table, and, you know, we're talking about this matter of... <laughs> It's just the craziest thing in the world that they would have to ask the question. It's about something bigger than that. I saw you exploding earlier, but why are we asking this? And I'll tell you why we're asking this. Because Bob Mueller, the director of the FBI, was very patiently asked about six months ago, can an American be killed by a drone on U.S. soil? He and his answer, answer, instead of saying no, which every one of his predecessors would have said, he said, ask the White House. And John Brennan, who's about to be confirmed to run the CIA, was asked the same question uh, three weeks ago, and instead of saying no, his answer was, ask the White House. And when Eric Holder was asked, not yesterday, but two weeks ago, if an American... He equivocated. Could be, he equivocated. He eventually said no yesterday after Senator Ted Cruz asked him four times, and then he said no in the letter he wrote today. But there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. Eric Holder may say no in a three-line sarcastic letter to Engaged Senator Rand Engaged in combat. Paul. Engaged in combat. Exactly. And then he may have one of his underlings write a 16-page or a 600-page memorandum to the White House changing his mind and we'll never see that. I don't understand. I don't know if there's a big picture of something going on or they're just in such chaos that they can't get anything done. I'm guessing the latter. But you talk about room for conspiracy theorists to go to go off their their their, their online cliff. I mean, it's bad enough that they're putting the things up there and watching us. It's bad enough that they've got cameras on every corner and, and, and stopping us. You know, you, your car runs a red light. Now, we, all we're sure of is that if I'm engaged in combat, they, unless I am, they can't kill me while I'm sitting at the cafe down the street. I'm not sure they can't look in my window. When they killed Anwar al Awlaki, they also it was born an in, American citizen. Correct. Killed him. Never charged with a crime. Much and less no one convicted. said a word. Correct. They also killed his 16-year-old son, who done nothing. What did this? And, you what know did, what they said? They said he picked a bad father. Correct. And the they Are you kidding me? of whom you speak is Robert Gibbs, the president's chief spokesperson. It is reprehensible. that Now you understand why this question came about. If a government thinks it can do this and speak glibly about it, and they can do it because he was in Yemen, can they do it if he's in Greenwich Village? You talk about slippery slope. Yes. But my point is, and only was, if we have to ask this question even, then we've gone so far beyond what that document has to say that we really, really need some, we, we need, we need some mirror work. Arthur will tell you, and I'll tell you, Half the time, most of the time, when a lawyer for the government is in the courtroom, they spend their time justifying the government, evading and avoiding the Constitution rather than complying with it. We are now seeing that played out in a potentially fatal way. Yeah, well, nobody and freaked out when they killed an American citizen overseas, and I don't know why. I couldn't figure out why they didn't freak out. Oh, because when the they, evidence against them is overwhelming. If it's so overwhelming, indict them and charge them. I'm going to tell you something. I have friends I have in the intelligence seconds. community who say there were CIA agents right there who could have arrested him. Instead, they killed him. We are not through with this. Stay with us. For the moment, I'm on this drone thing. I mean, there was some question about whether the government can murder a citizen? Seriously? I think there's issues relating to a court and I think that's going to be worked out that's going to be worked out I mean look these are these are terrorism cases this is 9-11 stuff uh, admittedly it bothers people like me um, I don't have the evidence I don't have all the information you know I'm a private citizen now so I can't see uh, what evidence is against the yeah. person but you know we got to protect ourselves we, we like to deal with facts around here and we have a series of facts on Anwar al that if they don't bother you okay bully for you but when you put them together to people who like that document that the country was founded on, it doesn't sound great. They were following him for 48 hours, Anwar al an American citizen following him overseas. He wanted to do a lot of bad things. He'd done a lot of bad things. He's a very bad guy. They're following him. Judge Napolitano, 
Couldn't they have just arrested him? Well, they had a team of American intelligence agents and Yemen, in, Yemen intelligence agents. He was, he was in Yemen. Yeah. So they were following him for 48 hours, in, in part to guide the drone so the drone would know where he was, in part to make sure that it was him. Of course they could have arrested him. He's in a country that has friendly relations with That's us. Correct. And the country's agents were right there as part of the, as part of the surveillance team. If they had arrested him there, this is interesting, it would have been illegal because he hadn't been charged with a crime because the government didn't want to indict him because it was afraid that the process of trying him might expose some uncomfortable truth. That's where we are. Now, this, this, is, this is the bottom line. This is the fact. The government had information that if they had indicted him, they would have had to put out into the public. They didn't need that information going public. Got it. But because of that, it made the decision to murder, and to kill an American citizen who was accused of all these bad things, but not charged, not tried, not Miranda, nothing. And they also killed his son who'd done nothing. Our government sent a missile down, killed a man who was wanted for something, but not charged or indicted, and killed his son. America? That's really? what generated the debate that brought Senator Paul to his feet for 13 hours yesterday and the reluctance of the FBI director and soon to be CIA director and at some point Attorney General to give a clear answer to that question. The government killed a man and his son. Look, uh, Governor, there was some release of documents that I think happened this morning that may have eased uh, Brennan's nomination. Look, this is you know, this is, I think, a, a debate this nation should have, and I commend you for doing this, but we don't have all the information. I mean, there could be some very drastic things that were, that were going to happen with this guy. It might have been. And, he killed his son. Yeah. Well, could have arrested him. No, okay. I, I'm just asking. I just wonder if, if that's okay with America. It, it, are things so bad that we can just go around to other nations and shoot and kill people, even our own citizens. And then how's it going to be when China gets all kind of worked up over something and sends a little flying thing over us? You know, but presidents have to make decisions that protect the national interests of the United States if there's imminent danger to our people. Got to follow the rule of law, too, though. And, yeah, but, you know, there's some circumstances where those tough choices need to be and they're very tough choices. And it is. And there are difficult circumstances. And one of the circumstances with which we're dealing now is agents from two governments following an American citizen for 48 hours, knowing exactly where he was at every moment, so that they could send a drone down to kill him. And they killed his son, too, when it appears at least they could have handled this in another way. But they didn't because they didn't want information getting out. It seems to some that maybe what they should do is figure out another way to deal with the information, maybe reform the system to some degree, rather than doing something that governments of other countries might do, like, for instance, Syria. But our government doesn't do that, but as far that, as I knew. But, Shep, what if that Alawi guy had information about an imminent attack on the United States? There have to be protections of sources and methods. So sure. We don't have all the facts. We don't have all the facts. But we know that slopes sometimes get slippery, and that and there's concern that this might be one of them. If killing an American citizen overseas who had all kinds of crap on him now ask, leads us to ask the question about whether somebody can be shot, shot out of their chair in a, in a cafe down the street with a missile and it takes five days and three different levels of government to get an answer and it still has the definition of is is in the middle of it, I, I would submit that it's possible that the slope is slippery and we're in a different spot so now. Why is the government so jealously and zealously guarding information which is in the law, which it should share with us about what its powers are and what its powers are not? And how can we be having a debate this year that the founders had in 1787 when they wrote the Fifth Amendment that says whenever the government wants life, liberty, or property of any person, doesn't have to be an American, doesn't have to be in America, they have to follow due process. There's strange times. Airport security, <laughs> where they don't either. It's, it's not a question of whether terrorists will get through, it's a question of when terrorists will get through. That's from a tr former Transportation Security Administration screener who claims the whole metal detector, take out your shoes, take out your pat down, the whole thing, it's just a show, just to make you feel better. And it does absolutely nothing to keep any of us safer. That's what this screener says. The former screener worked at New York Liberty International Airport and spoke anonymously with the New York Post, which our parent company owns. He or she claimed goofing off and long bathroom breaks are the norm. 
and that many men screeners seem to pay more attention to the women passengers than they do searching for potential threats, though they always find your shampoo. The former screener went on to say, quote, a small number of screeners are delusional zealots who believe they're keeping America safe by taking your snow globe, your two-inch pocket knife, your four-ounce bottle of shampoo, and performing invasive pat-downs on your kids. The rest are only there for the paychecks and generous benefits. With us now, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, who must be shocked by this revelation. <laughs> Chef, we don't know who this uh, anonymous former worker was, but he's certainly articulating what a lot of people feel, that the level of intrusiveness is irritating, is unlawful, is unconstitutional, is embarrassing, and just as importantly as those, doesn't keep it safe. Now we have it from the inside that much of what they do is for show. Now, I, I don't know where it goes from here, except that this person, whoever he or she is, is saying what many people who fly through Newark International Airport and other American airports have believed for a long time. Much of this is no good, it's irritating, and it's just to make us think that the government is doing something to, to keep us safe when it's not doing anything realistic at all. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, we can go back to when the early days of the war on terror when they told us what you need to do to keep yourself safe is to put visqueen and, and duct tape around all your windows and then they tell us put your hands up in the air like this and let, let's take a picture of your private parts then you're going to be fine and oh by the way give me the bottle of shampoo it's preposterous every airline you know official who we've had on this this newscast says the same thing but judge they got 87,000 employees it's big business you can't get rid of those jobs yes you're right chap it's an enormous enormous bureaucracy uh, President George W. Bush, to his credit, did not want to create a Department of Homeland Security. He did not want these people to be unionized. He wanted them to be privatized. Some of them are privatized, Shep. They do wear yep. the uniforms of TSA agents, but they're private employees whose corporations have a contract with the federal government. This guy who or gal who complained to the New York Post is not one of them, but is a former government employee who obviously hated his work and hated his employer. Don't you wonder who, what the meeting was like when they were all sitting around, all the big TSA bigwigs, and they go, you know what? I think now we're going to tell them they can bring knives on the plane. I think that'll make them feel better. Just don't miss the shampoo. Who is doing the thinking here? They need a Fraser Sitel. I, I, I don't know how they decide these things. And to, to the average flying public, it's absurd that you can bring a golf club, a baseball bat, or a pen knife, but not a bottle of water or shampoo. They probably have some kind of studies. They probably have some kind of polls and statistics. But what they lack is common sense. They don't talk to you. They don't interact with you. They just get in your face and make your experience uncomfortable. And they don't keep us safe. That's basically what this guy is saying. I think you're going to feel, or gal, I think you're yep. going to hear more people as they leave TSA supporting what this person has said. This has caused quite a stir over here today, my friend. Yeah, I'm not surprised. You know, the, the goal is always get through there without somebody doing to you something which if done in the public would be a felony you know i, I just want to make sure to take the belt off so that i, I don't get that whole that whole business because i don't have any need for that judge napolitano thank you pleasure chef this is the most transparent administration in history just about every uh law that we pass every rule that we uh uh implement we put online for everybody there to see. President Obama insists his administration is the most transparent in history, but a new analysis by the AP finds our government is actually becoming more secretive. Last year, the feds rejected more than a third of public requests for information, an increase from the year before. More worrisome, the length they're going to protect those government secrets. Here to explain, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you, Judge. Good morning, Gretchen. So it's, it's interesting to see the juxtas, uh, juxtaposition of the president saying the most transparent administration ever, and then the fewer documents that were sent. Well, you know, this is really the most secretive administration ever. The president uh, likes to do uh, executive things without telling the Congress and without telling the public. And when someone asks for information under the Freedom of Information Act, a statute written in response to abuses in the uh, Nixon administration, the presumption of which is that everything the government does is available for everybody to look at, the administration reacts to that act by saying it's a secret. And it's such a secret, we can't even tell you why it's a secret. I'll, I'll give you an example. 
um, the, the government's drone policy is based upon legal argument. And the legal argument is based upon published opinions by judges. So there's nothing secret about those opinions. But the Obama administration persuaded a federal judge here in New York City that their reasoning, their legal argument in the opinions was so secret and so sensitive that they couldn't even share it with her, the federal judge, much less the public. And the federal judge accepted that argument. So the CIA last year became more secretive. Nearly 60% of the requests were denied. The State Department answered only 57% of its requests, down from 75% a year earlier. It's your argument that the president sets the tone for his other department heads with oh, regard absolutely. to how they Look, handle Oh, The this? president himself couldn't possibly review all of these Freedom of Information Act requests. And, and the numbers can be a little a little misleading because they're percentages of requests and requests change each year depending upon the public's right, appetite ap appetite for information but the thrust of this administration has been stonewall and find a way not to show to the public what we are doing why because this administration more than any other in modern times the hallmark of it is the president doing things on his own because he can't get the Congress to agree with him because he wants to move the country too far to the left. Maybe. So if he can do it on his own and not tell us about it, we won't even know what he's done. That's their theory, and they're getting away with it. All right. Judge Henry Napolitano, thanks as always. Gretchen Elizabeth, have a nice day. <laughs> it's going to become my new name. It's my middle name. Thanks, Judge. Well, you're probably feeling it. Week two of sequestration hell. Okay, so far no hell, but just you wait. Remember. When cuts just kicked in, Homeland's uh, Security Secretary, Janet Napolitano, said there would be two-hour delays. Never happened, so now she's saying this. Fortunately, this is one of the lighter travel periods of the year. Lucky for you, otherwise, well, we'd have to walk. To the judge who says that all of this backtracking because poll numbers show those sequestration scares are actually backfiring. I think you're right about that. Can I say, Cousin Janet, stop trying to scare us, please. <laughs> Nobody believes what you're saying. The sky didn't fall. The government can live with an increase of 98% instead of 100% on the dollar of the planned increase. They're still preaching that line. And the polls are showing that the public is not believing the president or, most respectfully, Cousin Janet, of course, I, I kid about this nickname, uh, and it's hurting them because they, they uh, over-threatened. Well, it's hurt the president's approval uh, rating. I mean, that was among other things. But it, uh, what do you think's going on? I think people, after a while, say, all right, I remember this record last year. I remember this record the year before. I remember this tune. It's I a familiar tune. I think the president misread his victory, Neil. I think he decided he could turn hard left. I think he forgot that the people sent to the People's House a substantial Republican majority intending to put a break on the president. The voters obviously want divided government. We had it for many years in the presidencies of Bill Clinton for George W. Bush and now Barack Obama. And that is telling the president something. The government is not just yours. You want to accomplish your goal, they're going to be tempered by the other party, which is in power in the House or the Senate, as the case may be. This president doesn't want to hear that. So to go around the Congress, he'll scare the daylights out of people. And the people recognize that, and they don't like to be misled. But, you know... Um you can only play this game so many times, right? Yes, and yes. and it, it might have had the desired effect, I say desired in the fiscal sense, of, of getting people annoyed to the point, fix this, quit whining about it, quit scaring us about it, fix it. Or am I being needlessly optimistic? I, I think the, the president thought that the people would say to the Republicans, oh, the heavens are going to fall. You heard what the president said. You heard what Janet Napolitano said. You heard what Eric Holder said. You, you can't let the sequester happen, even though the president originated the idea, the president pushed for it, the president once threatened he would veto it if the Congress attempted to, to dismantle it. But the people didn't buy that. I think the people recognized that it's time for the government to tighten its belt a little bit. And remember, it wasn't a cut in spending. It was a reduction in the increase in spending, even though the president, again, misled the public into thinking that, oh, the Republicans are taking food out of the mouths of babes. The public didn't buy it. Didn't it's buy. showing in the polls. You know, the polls are always a few weeks behind the events that True influence enough. them. Now we see the, uh, the people reacting to the government scare tactics of a few weeks ago.
Thank you, Judge. Uh, but Mano laid it all out, said it was going to have to actually happen this whole way. And he's been hungry. I mean, he's a, <laughs> he just looks great. We're all jealous that of him. Pizza smells terrific. Yes, indeed it does. Don't you touch mine. It seems like President Obama is using every opportunity to scare Americans in one of disastrous cutbacks when se sequestration takes full effect. Border Patrol agents will see their hours reduced. FBI agents will be furloughed. Federal prosecutors will have to close cases and let criminals go. Air traffic controllers and airport security will see cutbacks, which means more delays at airports across the country. Sounds pretty bad, right? So why did the government just put up WAN ads for thousands of open jobs? Can you figure this out? I can't. So we wheeled in Judge uh, Napolitano, who is at an undisclosed location. Uh, you're in Washington, are you? Uh, yes, Judge, I am. How, do, how does this happen? How does the government at one point say it's a tragedy, at other point say we need people? You know, the president, uh, at, at best, doesn't understand the law. At worst, is misleading the American people. As we all know now, the sequester is not a cut. This is federal spending without the sequester continuing to go up. This is federal spending with the sequester continuing to go up. The difference between this and this is 2%. So instead of being able to hire 100 additional TSA agents, the government can only hire 98. Now, these, these 3,000 new jobs, some of them could be to replace people that left. But some of them also are new jobs. Why? Because the president has the power to move money around. He can't take money from justice and send it to defense. But he can take money from the army and send it to the navy. He can take money from the GSA, the Government Services Administration, which owns all these buildings in Washington, and move it to um, uh, some support staff. So he can find ways to get the people to do the work that he needs, notwithstanding his protests that he couldn't. But Judge, so in the sequestration legislation, it allows that flexibility? It's not in the sequestration legislation, Brian. It's because we don't have a budget. Even though federal law, written by Congress, requires the Congress to produce a budget by February right. 1st of each year, we don't have one. Without a budget, the president can move funds around, and he must know gotcha. that. All right, there's another topic you want to talk about. Uh, talking about uh. the U.S. now is going to let spy agencies scour our finances, Americans' finances. What does this mean? What's the objective? Well, the objective is to look for a needle in a haystack. The objective is to let every spy agency in America, we know of 16 of them, Brian, there may be others, look at all financial information, every, every check you've ever, uh, you've ever cashed, every deposit you've ever made, to see if they can make any connection between the innocent, normal commercial activity of hundreds of millions of Americans and the evil uh, deeds uh, of a few. Right. So this will be a gross violation of privacy. It's lawful because Congress says it's lawful, but it is a profound violation of the right to privacy guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment. You mean everyone's going to find out that you have a uh, American Express black card now? Everybody's going to find it out, wow. but but I'm not worried because wherever I go, I'm taking Allison with me. All right, good. And, and you got to take I, Ainsley. I will, They're a team. I will, I will never defy Allison again, and I apologize for all those times <laughs> I frustrated her. She could kill me. Ju Judge, Judge Andrew you. Napolitano, thanks so much. <laughs> Allison, I'll get to you in a second. All right, and, and I'll see you soon, Judge. America. Ding dong, the Twinkie is not <laughs> dead. Hostess Brand has agreed to sell the Twinkie and ding dong along with ho ho snowballs, Dolly Madison zingers to two investment firms. The deal is worth, reportedly worth more than $410 million. All of those brands will probably make a comeback by this summer. Paul Ryan released his budget earlier this week. The Democrats followed yesterday with their own version. But what about President Obama? We've seen no budget from the White House, despite a legal requirement that the budget be submitted to Congress by the first Monday in February. All rise. He's here. The judge, Andrew Napolitano. Is that a law? Yes, it's a federal statute that Congress imposed upon the, uh, itself and the president. It doesn't have to generate with the president. It could generate with someone in the House. It could generate with someone in the Senate. But it's, it's a statute that must be enacted. The so, budget is a statute that Congress enacts and the president signs into law. And Congress so, has imposed upon itself the obligation to do it by the first Monday in February. It's four years. We haven't Correct. had one. Correct. That, that's flat out breaking the law, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. So what's the penalty? Nothing. When, when you or I or Emac or Charles or anybody watching us now breaks a law that Congress imposes upon us, there is a consequence. When Congress breaks its own laws that it imposes upon itself, 
there is no consequence. There's no consequence to the members of Congress. There's no consequence to the government. The government's not going to fine itself. So obviously they can't make it by the first Monday in February because that's passed. This is the first Monday in February preceding the fiscal year, which starts on October 1st. So they can't make it for this year. They haven't made it for the past four years. The only sanction is political. That, yeah, Congress is breaking the laws that's written. We'll vote them out of office. That's the theoretical consequence. But if nobody cares, there is no penalty. Correct. If the, if the penalty is political, people vote against the president and his party, then there is no penalty because it's not seeped through that this is an important thing. Right. Now, here and if, the media, if the media essentially protects the president and the Democrats in Congress, then it's not going to seep through to the public and there will be no penalty. Well, that, that's where I think it's a good, if you don't mind me saying so, that we're having this conversation. I, I don't think this keeps people awake at night, but they ought to know that the Congress does not follow its own laws and that there are real consequences to this. I'll give you an example of a real consequence. Because there is no budget, the president is free to move cash within a department. So if the defense, defense department gets, I'll just throw a number out, $100 billion, they get a lot more. The president is free to send all of that to the Army, or all of that to the Navy, or all of it to, to uh, West Point, because there are no budget items that force him to spend in accordance with Congress's will. So that's an advantage, president. Yes, but wait a second. This sequester cuts. Two point whatever it is percent. Yes. The president said, "We've got to cut vaccinations for children in Georgia. We've got to cut White House tours." Do you think you're the telling president me that was that's being not, candid? Is that not accurate? Do you think the president was being knowledgeable? So wait a second. Because of the absence of a budget, the president is free to cut what he wishes, and he can put the money wherever he likes. Absolutely. If he wants to hire a hundred soldiers, well, why is he this only known? has to hire ninety-eight? He can hire the hundred and not hire somewhere else or not spend somewhere else. There is no legal mechanism to prevent him from switching funds from A to B so long as the total in each department raises to raises 98 percent instead of 100 percent. We are two weeks into the sequester. You and cuts. I have discussed this. I've not, I've not heard this. I oh, did sure. not know that in the sure. absence of a budget, the president is free to direct money where he chooses. Didn't Absol know that. Absolutely he is. Remember, the sequester doesn't cut. It reduces the increase. Okay. So instead of going up 100 cents on the dollar, the proposed increase, it goes up 98 cents. What happens to that two cents? He can grab it from here and he can grab it from there. And he has not done that. He's not done it. He and said he claims he we're can't cutting do it. there and we're cutting there. There's, there's, it's like there's no mechanism pain. to that prevent is... him from doing it. With a budget, <sighs> there would be a mechanism to prevent him from doing it. President Nixon attempted not to spend budgetary items that Congress had authorized. Well, we've got continuing... The Supreme Court said you have to spend it because it's in the budget. Continuing resolutions under which we allocate money, that does not constitute a budget. Correct. Okay. Right. Correct. They're out of time. And, and they all know that. Uh, uh, Congressman uh, Ryan, whatever you think of the numbers, has at least tried to comply with the law. Where have you although been he's, hiding this Although he's a little late. You're on the show every single day, and I didn't know that. I only talk about Where the subjects been? that you and the Queen request. <laughs> 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 that was good. That was good. He's right, Philip. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Judge, thank you very much indeed. That Pleasure. was good. <laughs> Thanks. I, I want you to hear this 911 call where you can hear the operator pleading with a nurse at a retirement home to perform CPR, CPR on a patient who's barely breathing. Now, the nurse won't do it because it's against company policy. Listen to this. We need to get CPR started. That's not enough. Okay. Um, let me. Uh, yeah, we can't do CPR. So okay, then hand the phone. Just hand down the phone to the passerby. Oh, Anybody not. there can do CPR. Give them the phone, please. If they're refusing okay. CPR. They're going to let her die. Yes, yeah, a human being. I don't. You know, is there anybody there that's, yeah. that's willing to help this lady and not let her die? Um, not at this time. Well, the nurse continues to refuse, and by the time the paramedics arrive, too late, the patient dies. Okay. Now, uh, to me, this is a case of lawsuit mania. Let's see if Judge Andrew Napolitano agrees. That nurse would not deliver CPR because she was scared that the hospital or the facility, I should say, would be sued. Yes. I mean, well, listen, I don't know what was in the, uh, in the nurse's head. Uh, this is California. California has a Good Samaritan rule which immunizes the, the person who delivers emergency services from liability for the failure of those services to have the required or the hoped for uh, result as long as they're done in good faith. The, the uh, subsequent investigation reveals that the woman who died, who was a patient at the uh, uh, facility, mm -hmm. signed an agreement saying, if you 
are in extremists, we will not revive you. It is not our obligation to do so. We are here to keep you comfortable and we're here to feed, as cold as this sounds, it's the agreement. Right. We're here to keep you comfortable and to feed you, but not to, to prolong your life. So I don't think there is any liability on the part of the nurse, as cold as uncaring as it may seem. But sound. the facility had laid down the law so strongly because they want to avoid lawsuits at all costs, which would put them out of I, business. I don't think that such a lawsuit will survive a motion to dismiss. In other words, someone may, someone, it's a, her estate may well, you file get, this Wait a lawsuit. second, wait a second. You get this in front of a jury. Oh, no, it won't get to a jury. That's why I said a motion to dismiss. Her, her uh, estate may file the lawsuit. But I would think that the lawyers for the insurance carrier for the uh, health care facility where the nurse worked will move to dismiss it. And it will be dismissed and it ought to be dismissed because there is no, again, I this sounds cold, but there is no affirmative obligation on the part of a health care provider licensed by the state, doctor, nurse, or, or some other such provider, to help a person in extremists. You haven't convinced me that the legal system in the United States of America dismisses enough I didn't say in the United lunatic. States of America because it's different in each state. And as crazy as California is, California does have the Good Samaritan rule, which says if you help, you can't be sued. And if you don't help, you can't be sued. But the nurse didn't know that. And well, I'll we bet don't you the know what well, this nurse knew. No, no, of course we don't. But I, I, don't, I know what we do know. I'll bet you that this facility laid down the law to all its employees, don't do this, don't do that, because you could be sued. And we don't want to, get, we don't want to go outside this, this narrow area at all because we worry about a lawsuit. Well, they, you know that's the case, If Judge. that is the case, it's reprehensible. But it's lawsuit one, mania in correct, America. Uh, particularly in California. One would think that a patient in a health care facility would have their life saved and the health care facility would not be concerned about a lawsuit. But, but this I is blame the I blame the lawsuit. The woman who, who made the 911 call, at this point, she's got to feel like, you know, just, just totally distraught. You know, that's Does a good she question. have a lawsuit who, against her employer? I don't know who yeah, made the 911 call. No, she doesn't have a lawsuit against her. Because she say, listen, my employer stopped me from helping this woman. I thought I would be under some legal jeopardy, and it turns out I wouldn't have been. And now I've got to live with this guilt the rest of my life. Well, that's the price she pays for working in that terrible place. The only conceivable lawsuit would be the estate of the woman who died. Now, the woman was 87 years old and in a nursing yeah. home. What, what is her income? Right. What is the income right. loss I, right. like? This is a bad day. taste in my mouth because yes, the, yes, the yes, impact of this you. litigious society is, in this case, that absolutely tragic, reprehensible, and frankly disgusting. Yes. And that's the last word. Agreed, agreed, agreed. That's the last word. <laughs> is this an example of the legal system run amok? A jury, not a judge, a jury in Los Angeles ordered Johnson & Johnson to pay $8.3 million in damages to a patient over a defective hip. The jury said J&J &J was negligent, that they were negligent in the design of the hip. Judge Napolitano is here. By the way, there are 10,000 more lawsuits of exactly the same nature coming. Okay? Well, that wouldn't surprise me because you, you, you know that... Uh these manufacturers of, of, of medical devices are prime targets for plaintiff's lawyers. Yeah, uh, look, and once they hit in one of them, that sometimes yes. causes the manufacturer to settle many others that they wouldn't ordinarily settle in order to avoid the cost of, of the look, lawsuit. This kind of thing drives me crazy. And do rightly so. Do, do you really think that a jury is in a position to decide whether the design of an artificial hip was good or bad? Well, that gets back to American history because the Constitution guarantees a jury trial. So here's how it works. The plaintiff's lawyers bring in experts, designers and physicians, and they give their opinion as to why this thing was improperly designed. The manufacturer brings in its experts and they give their opinion as to why it was improperly designed. And a lay jury is supposed to decide which expert they believe. That's been the system in America for 200 years. It's not working. It is well, not it results. Working. It results in places like California and New Jersey, our home state, yep. having notorious biases towards plaintiffs. The jurors are biased towards the plaintiff. The law is biased towards the plaintiff. The articulation of the law by the judge is biased towards the plaintiff. You get these huge verdicts, and who pays for it? We do. Everybody. Yep. Insurance premiums goes up. Yep. The cost of doing business uh, goes up. It goes up for everybody all over the country, even though plaintiffs are hitting, so to speak, with these $8 million verdicts in places like Southern California and New Jersey. And there is every incentive for the lawyers to sue because they will get 
30% of anything that can take off J&J &J plus expenses. Yes. Of that yes, 8 well, you're million actually, dollars, You're actually being uh, modest when you say 30% because be in some states it's, uh, it's more. In some states it's whatever the lawyers can negotiate for. Like in New York, in New Jersey, the, there's a cap on what the lawyers can earn. And the more they earn, the uh, lower the percentage goes. Yeah. Why isn't tort reform? Real tort, why is that not part of Obamacare? Because if you want to get the cost of medical services down, you get rid of the lawyers. Well, one of the reasons tort reform is not part of Obamacare is because the tort system in America is not a national system. It's 50 state systems, 51 if you count the District of Columbia, and it's different in every state. It's not regulated by the feds. It's regulated by the legislature and yeah. the courts. And the trial lawyers are the principal contributors and let me to tell you President where Obama. they have their influence in the state legislatures. That's why in Texas, it's no longer a plaintiff's state because the trial lawyers lost influence there and the laws have swung over towards a more a centered equilibrium. But in places like New Jersey and California, trial lawyers have inordinate influence with the legislature and with the courts yes. because trial lawyers become judges. But the people in Texas will still have to pay the much higher prices for artificial hits. Yes, because, because that's, a national, that's because, a national market. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. exactly, exactly. So they, they may save themselves local expense, but they don't save themselves on the cost of purchasing a nationally produced product. Would you be prepared to agree with me that this is an example of the American legal system run riot and it uh, needs control? Well, I don't know that I would say run riot, but, but it's an example of this happening in localities. Yes, this would not happen in other parts of the country the way it's happened in Los Angeles or, or uh, in New Jersey. Yes. And I, I would agree with you that the consequences of this are not thought through by the judges and the jurors and even the legislatures that permit it to happen. Of course they it's themselves not. are paying for it it's without realizing it. Look, some poor person who has been injured by this will limp into court, look absolutely terrible in front of the jury, and the case is lost. Well, some injuries are serious and legitimate injuries. I mean, yeah, of course are, they are. They I'm not I suggesting they're not. These people are entitled to compensation. But a, de a defective design? A jury is equipped to make that decision? You know, I we, just don't believe we, this. We decided in this country 230 years ago, it's better to have juries decide that than judges. I'm smiling because I know you don't want to get into <laughs> the decisions that happened 230 years ago <laughs> and what propelled those decisions. It's just that we you... don't want them to go there, Stuart. <laughs> you, always, you always go back to that. You always go back to that. You always accuse me of not understanding hey, the know, American No, system. no, no, I don't accuse you of that. I'm just suggesting you may not want to get into the historical in, uh, impulses <laughs> for those Can I, can I ask you real quick, decisions. Judge, on that Talk note, uh, there's been a lot of talk of professional juries, you know, and people who would understand the design, you know, professionals, uh, not attached to anyone who could actually make a more intelligent decision on, on, on stuff yeah. like this. Well, that would require, that would require a, a, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution and, in some states, the state constitution. In, in our home state of New Jersey, it is the state constitution that guarantees right. you a jury as well as the federal constitution. Well, aren't, aren't lawyers investigated by their own? Yes. Well, why aren't doctors and drug companies investigated by their well, own? Well, in a sense, they are, because sometimes the court can appoint a doctor to advise the court and the jury as to what the, how the, the medicine actually played out. Because when an expert is hired by the plaintiff, that expert's going to say what the plaintiff is paying the doctor to say. Well, and when an expert is hired by the defense, that expert's going to say what the defense has paid them to say. And the jury has to decide who they believe. It's almost a swearing match between expert witnesses. Which expert witness presented the more attractive, the more credible case? That's what it sometimes comes down to. The American legal system is not equipped to deal with medical disputes, period. In some no, cases, it gets like carried it away, like this one that we're talking about, we without knowing pay. the facts in the we case. We all pay for No it. dispute that we all pay for it, and no dispute that the jurors are not permitted to take that into account, that we all pay for it. Thank in you, fact, in New Jersey, you can't even use the word insurance policy in the courtroom. Really? Yes. Great I'm not economist. There's more than $20 trillion sitting in offshore tax havens. Now, the economist wants to reform the tax laws so we can bring that money back where it belongs, either to America or various other tax jurisdictions around the world. Judge Andrew Napolitano is here. I thought he was going to disagree with that. Is he?
It's what are you going to say? Such a loaded question. Bring the money back home where it belongs. Did it I say belongs? where it belongs? Long. Yeah, I, th I think you did. But I think, in fairness to you, you were paraphrasing The Economist. I was. Because I suspect you secretly agree with me on this. It belongs wherever the person who owned the money wants it to be. Now, now let's get this straight. If you earn $1,000 in the United States, you can't avoid paying income tax on that by shipping it to an offshore account. But if you earn $1,000 in the United States, pay taxes on it, and what's left after the taxes, you put in an offshore account, and that generates interest. The question is, is that interest taxable in the United States? That's the dispute. Yes. The economist argues that, in, in my hypothetical, the 1000 is really $20 trillion. So whatever the interest on the $20 trillion would be is a huge number, and whatever the tax on that interest is is a huge okay. number okay. All right. that the governments aren't getting. So should we bring it back? Of course not. It's the, it's the decision of the person who sent it there. They've already paid taxes on it. It's their money. But it the wasn't law generated says, in the U.S. But the law says you must declare the interest and the dividends and the capital gains on any assets that you have overseas if you're resident in the United States of America. I, I understand that. That's the law. Well, one must obey the law. I'm not suggesting that people should violate the law. It's a bad law because the United States has no claim on that. It was not it, the interest on, on that thousand generated in the offshore account was not generated in the United States of America. So they have no right to tax it. Tell me, what chance of some political success would you have in the United States if you went out there and campaigned on the issue, oh, I've got a Cayman Islands bank account, I think it's great, I'm going to put my money over there and you're not going to touch it. Do you really think <laughs> that I tailor my views to their popularity amongst voters? No, that's why people like you will lose. <laughs> I am not running for office. I am seeking the truth. So, you think, you agree with The Economist? No, you don't agree with no, The Economist. No, I disagree, you disagree, I disagree with The Economist. With the economist. Okay. I say, once you've paid taxes on your money, it is yours to send it where you want. And if it's outside the U.S., the United States government has no claim to the interest that it earns. Not only I, but thousands and thousands of people around the world, I suspect my humble host, secretly agree with Look at, that. Look at the hand action. <laughs> Not even I. <laughs> now, would you let me join the Senate committee interrogating Bernanke? We'll have a field day. Not a prayer. Not a prayer. And apparently, Rand Paul who may have been expected to ask some pretty sharp-edged questions. He's not, he's not on the committee, so he's not going to be asking questions today, unfortunately, because that, that would be some fireworks. And it would certainly be worth covering. Yes, it would be worth covering. Well, we're going to cover right, it. Right, like when he said to Hillary, Benghazi, I would have fired you. <laughs> <laughs> That's worth covering. Yes. All right, now, wait a minute. Come on, company. $20 trillion sits in tax havens around the world. It's been put there by people who have high tax jurisdictions. It may be Britain, it may be Europe, it may be America, it may be Canada, Sweden, wherever, okay? Should it be repaid? Should we change the tax laws to go get that money Absolutely and bring it no. back? No. Absolutely not. Uh, so. To your point, it's there not because individuals necessarily want it there. It's there because you've got governments already taking too much money and people are afraid. Yeah, people you know, I love, this keep it. I love this attitude that only spending cuts are austerity. You know what? Tax no. hikes are austerity. You too. should have listened to uh, Veronique de Rougy, who is on the show sitting right where the judge was sitting terrific. earlier. She's done a study, a guy, along with a gentleman from Harvard, that shows that the austerity in Europe is not That's spending not cuts. It's That's not austerity. It's tax, tax increases. Yes. That's yes. what they're doing. And they call it yes. austerity, and then, it's, then they say it doesn't work when they're trying That's to right. prove That's a point. That's what tipped uh, Italy into recession. <laughs> that, a lot of tax Krugman's hikes. point, uh, which he endlessly yeah. goes on about, is that austerity in Europe is wrong. Right. Spending cuts right. are wrong. Well, there, He's got it right. It's not spending cuts. It's Krugman, tax increases. What Krugman fails to understand is there was a natural point at which ta when taxes get above that point, it's absolutely counterproductive and destructive. And human beings will do everything that their imagination conjures to avoid that higher rate. Yes. Lower the rate, make more money, collect more taxes. You know, he simply doesn't understand that. You know, on the Where right side. Where does he so, teach? On, on the right side. Oh, Harvard. And no, no, it was Princeton. <laughs> You're all the matter. Yes. And he won a Nobel Prize for being nasty. Oh, my well, the president won no. a Nobel Prize for peace and he kills Americans. That's not good. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on a roll until you said that. <laughs> All right, uh, Judge, not bad.